So this is going to be very exciting today. We're starting the podcast series where we're going to be interviewing doctors who already work in Germany, giving them the opportunity to tell us their experiences, what they went through, what they did right, what they did wrong, and giving others the opportunity to learn from them. So for all of you who don't know, my name is Itai Shahar. I am a medical doctor in Germany in the field of ophthalmology. I came to Germany in 2016, 2017 actually, and learned German in Berlin, started working in cardiology. I also worked um, as a good doctor, which is sort of, uh, how should I translate that, uh, Mila? That is like a uh, medical examiner, I would say. Yeah, and, exactly. And I learned a lot of German there. That was my experience. You can learn more about me in our YouTube channel. And Mila, you want to say a few words about yourself? Yeah. Uh, so my name is Mila Alperson. I'm uh, the co-founder of uh, doctoringermany.com. Um, I live in Germany in the last uh, four years. I came from Israel. I graduated there from the medical school. And right now I'm also working in the field of ophthalmology and uh, really our goal um, of creating this channel, of creating our website is to help out our colleagues around the world who are interested in coming uh, to Germany and become licensed physicians here. We, we really want to help them out and um, we are doing that by sharing our experience, our knowledge, by bringing experts and bringing other colleagues who have already made it. Uh, so they will be able to share with you um, what they did and uh, you can learn uh, from their mistakes. When we found a doctor in Germany, we thought about the fact that there is a lack of information for international doctors and also especially for English speakers who still don't know German. And I think that's very important to, for them because you can, you can save so many mistakes that would cost you time, cost you money. And I think it's essential to get that information out there. And I would also add that it's not only, um, we, we aim to help not only those who want to become doctors in Germany, but also, also those who are already working as doctors in Germany, because uh, even after you get your license here in Germany, there are still so many things to know and to learn and so many difficulties to overcome. And it's, it's, it's a journey. So he came. He's Hi. Finally <laughs> Hi. How you going? How you going? What's up? Can you hear us then? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we, yes. we can. I can. We hear yeah. you well. Yeah, Great. sweet. So short disclaimer, I know Dan. I've, I've been knowing him for a while now. He came to Berlin in 2000. When was that, Dan, Dan? 17. 17. 2017. Uh, he stalked me on Facebook. And... Uh, <laughs> And we had a short chat and we got to know each other. Really, really cool story. I actually helped him back then, uh, saved, saved him some time. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Dan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, my name's Dan. I'm from Australia. I'm uh, 37 years old now and I've been here since uh, two, 2017. Um, yeah, and I'm in uh, my fourth year of anesthetics. So you made the move from Australia to Germany. Now, you would tell that to the average listener, he would be like, oh, yeah, why yeah. did he do that? <laughs> I get asked that a lot. Um, I think uh, people have uh, a, a, an interesting perception of Australia. They often just think of beaches and, and uh, nice weather. But I think in terms of work, it made a lot more sense for me to, to come to Germany, um, just given the, uh, the way the... the demand for doctors is, is much, much, much higher here, much greater compared to Australia. Um, they're in a different part of their, uh, the whole demand supply with doctors. So yeah, made a lot more sense. Uh, not necessarily, uh, 
um, financially because it costs initially a bit of money to come here, but uh, in terms of time, made made way more sense. Right. What were you doing in Australia? Were you already in residency? Mm, I'd uh, finished my internship here, and I was in my first year of. Uh, I wasn't really in a res in a residency program. I was just doing like a general residency, doing different rotations, mainly ED or emergency medicine, um, cardiology, a bit of internal medicine, just trying to try to build up my resume for to to get into anesthetics. And what did you not like about your job there that made you decide? Okay, I need to make a move. <laughs> I think the way the system um, is there at the moment, there's a glut of junior doctors, and um, the colleges that that run the the, the specialties, uh, they're they're like little protected societies, so they very much control the the number of new doctors that can train. So it takes a very long time to get into some specialties. Um, you end up spending a few years in limbo. Um, that's what I didn't like, and there's a lot more hierarchy. Uh, in the system over there compared to here. And I have a question, like you walk one day and you have told to yourself, okay, I'm uh, moving to Germany. So do you, how did you learn the German language? How did you apply? Can you tell us about this a little bit? I mean, I, I was born here, but then I left when I was three. Um, I didn't really speak much German obviously as a child, but I, I always had a connection to the country. So I'd always been, been coming back and forth um, with family. And over a few years prior to 2017, I'd been here a few times just for holidays and, and visiting friends and family and sort of just um, realized just just from basically speaking to family and friends, or, oh, you know, they'd, they'd sort of make um, passing comments that, oh, you should come work here because I've heard they need, they need a lot of doctors and um, this and that. And, and uh, initially it didn't really sort of, um, I didn't really take much notice, but then um, over time, I actually started to research uh, um, the opportunities here, especially as I started working in, in Australia um, and I started sort of trying to compare the two and, and did realize in terms of time, I mean, time-wise and training and all that kind of stuff that it would actually save me quite some time being here as opposed to Australia. And at that stage of my life, I was ready for a change because I think living in Australia is, you do feel very... Uh, isolated from from the rest of the world so it felt like a an obvious uh, decision um to live in europe and how did you launch the entire process um i remember i was doing night shifts in australia where we do one week of nights and one week off and during my one week that i had off i literally flew up to germany um arrived on the monday i had six interviews lined up i basically drove about two thousand kilometers from north from Berlin all the way down to, to T, uh, deep in, in Bavaria and in Degendorf and had multiple interviews and then uh, arrived back in Berlin on the Friday and flew back. So that was the first time I actually really seriously um, put my plan into action and I really didn't think much of it. And then when I think much of it, and then when I arrived um, back home, I ended up getting all six offers, all six job offers. And that's when I realized, oh, wow, this is actually, this is serious. I can really make this work. So that's when it started to get serious. And then I started then really considering, okay, you know, I need to start, um, you know, selling car, my car and all that kind of stuff. And maybe really considering moving over to Germany, thinking about where I want to live and apartment and that kind of stuff. I remember when we, when we began talking, you were actually telling me that I have a deja vu moment now. <laughs> and you were telling me that you got job offers from all of the places that you applied to. And then I asked you, like, what process are you in? Did you already do the, the exams? Like, no, I didn't do any exams. And I was like, what the mm. <laughs> do you even know how this works? You know? And you were, yeah. you were very positive. That was, that was, that's, you know, you, I think you didn't understand exactly the entire process, no. but no, tell us I'll... a little bit about that. What, with what mindset did you come here? Did you think it would be different than what it was? I, I very much came with a very uh, with a happy-go-lucky kind of uh, approach. I didn't take it initially seriously because it's it's quite a big decision to move away from a country like Australia because it's not. I mean, people have their reasons for leaving countries where they're in socio-economic difficulty. You know, where, where, be it the Middle East or South America or whatever. Um, but moving from Australia is a very odd decision. But uh, that's why I didn't initially take it very very seriously, and I. 
like you said, I didn't really plan anything. I hadn't even sat in the exams or considered the, um, uh, the process of getting my, my training recognized. I literally just spoke to a, um, a headhunter agency. He organized one or two of the interviews. And then I basically myself just sent off a whole bunch of, um, applications with my resume to other, um, hospitals and a few got back, a few didn't. And I managed to organize all six interviews in one week. And I just, uh, for me, it was just a test to see how, how serious is this? Am I, um, is anything really going to come, come of this? Um, and that's why I tried that initially for a week to see what, 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 what happens. And I was actually, uh, pleasantly surprised by six offers. And that's when I really started thinking, okay, now I need to take this process a bit more, a bit more seriously, start looking into the process of, a, you know, having my training recognized and, uh, et cetera. Okay. Cool question. Uh, the fact that you were born here, did that have any influence on your process to getting a visa or to stay here? Would, did, did that change anything for you? None whatsoever. None whatsoever. So how was that because... like, how was that like getting the visa? Uh, as a doctor, um, I guess if you're, if your listeners, uh, some of them may be aware that, uh, as doctors, you have this, um, blue card, blower carta. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's primarily for jobs that are in demand, um, mm -hmm. in Germany. It's, it's quite easy with that. I mean, you basically just need to, um, provide, uh, contracts, um, all the usual stuff that, you know, that you've found an apartment and you've got health insurance and you can get a, uh, a short-term visa that's connected with your, um, your job contract. So when your job contract ends, the blue card ends as well. And then if your job contract gets renewed, you get a, you get an extension with your visa. So it's a relatively easy process for, at least for us as doctors with the, um, with the blue card. Mm -hmm. And one question that we had on this topic from some viewers was, is the blue card actually blue? <laughs> no, it's not actually. <laughs> I can't, oh. I, I can't remember what my blue card looks like. It's not, it's not as blue as you'd think it is. It's not that blue. It's not blue. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Maybe purple, but not blue. <laughs> it's actually probably more purple. That's right. Yeah, it's probably yeah. more purple. So I have so a that, question. Yeah. Uh, 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 sorry for good. interrupting you. Uh, so we all know that in order to work here in Germany as a physician, as a licensed physician, you need to uh, to pass the Fachsprachprüfung, mm. yeah, which is the medical language exam. Mm -hmm. um, when did you apply to this exam? How was the preparation for you? What do you recommend maybe uh, uh, to, to the viewers? Um, what should they do? Uh, what mistakes have you made maybe? Well, in, in, in keeping with my very lackadaisical approach, uh, I initially just uh, uh, I didn't really do much, uh, for the, uh, for that exam. I, I, um, was, you know, just trying to pick up on, on a few words, then very sort of medical specific words and that kind of stuff. And then I landed, uh, into this, uh, landed in this group on Facebook and that's where I met Itai. And then we started chatting and he was saying he was studying for the, uh, the same, same exam. And he told me it's actually, it's harder than you think. And that's when I realized, geez, I better take this a bit more seriously. So then I started, uh, putting a lot more effort into it. And for that, I did end up engaging a, um, a gentleman who, I don't know if he's still around, is on the internet, he provides basically a service where you practice, you do a few practice runs with him um, of the Fachsprachprüfung. Um, um, and then he gives you tips on, on, on how to improve and all that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I did that with him and yeah, go on. No, I just, I don't want to enter into names of companies or other individuals, but, um, you were considering doing a certain course in Berlin, correct? Yeah. yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. Why didn't you do that? Uh, I was, I was considering doing a course in Berlin and then, um, I think it meant I would have had to have moved or I, I would have had to have come down to Berlin and, and have lived here for, to have lived here for, for four weeks or something like that. I can't exactly remember, but I think. I actually can't remember. Uh, maybe you, you told me about the course. That oh, it was... Let me, let me refresh your memory, Dan. <laughs> you wanted to come to Berlin. You wanted to do that course. Yeah. And I told you don't do it. Yeah. And, uh, the reason was because I was doing that course and the, okay. I mean, it, he was not that person who was teaching us. It did provide value, but yeah. I think it was something that you can get from a book or from on, an online mm. course. Um, and in that case, I think 
you know, you still passed it, even though you didn't come here and do it in, in on site. No, in the end, I did. I, this after what you told me about the course, I decided against it because it was too much of a time and, and financial commitment to actually move uh, that right. early. Um, but I ended up doing this other guy's course, which was purely online. So it was like a, yeah. a Zoom session, essentially. Mm -hmm. I did a f maybe four or five of those, and that was it. And I just did my little flashcards or whatever, um, and that's all I did. Uh, um, yeah. Just... How was the exam itself? No. Was it as difficult as you thought it would be? Was it? Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, it wasn't too bad. It was relatively short. I mean, you, you rock up. Um, you sit there. It's essentially divide into three parts you do the interview um i think it's over 20 minutes and then you do 20 minutes of writing um <clears throat> i think a summary or a, a basic sort of presentation um sometimes you have to do it by hand sometimes on a pc uh and then 20 minutes is spent presenting the uh the case to uh, a panel of three three doctors basically so all up maybe takes about an hour or a little bit more mm -hmm. and you passed the exam the first time yeah and you did it where in Bayern was it? In in Bavaria, yeah. Bavaria, in Munich. And that's also where you submitted your documents to get the entire process um, approved. That's right. And, yeah. Okay. And, over Bayern, yeah. Yeah. And that's it. That that was it. That's all you needed to, to become a licensed doctor in, uh, nah, in nah. Germany. I wish. I wish. No. I had. I had a bit of a. Uh, a longer process because they initially didn't approve my documents, and then because um, I came with came to Germany with the impression that, okay, I come from a good university in Australia, they'll accept my, my training, which wasn't the case. I ended up having to engage a lawyer um, with an appeal and, and all that kind of stuff. In the end, it didn't work out, and I ended up having to then do the uh, the Kenntnisprüfung. Okay. The Kenntnisprüfung, which is the medical knowledge exam. Yeah? yeah. Those. This is the exam that we are required to take when um, our credentials are not accepted by the German authorities yep. and we need to proceed with this exam before having mm -hmm. the German uh, medical license. Yep. Just shortly, if you can, I'm sure there are going to be listeners who are going to be in, sim in a similar situation and are going to mm -hmm. ask themselves, why didn't he get a license without the exam? I mean, you come from Australia, you came from a top university, you have the experience. What was it that you think made them reach that decision and what do you think may you may have done right or wrong in the process honestly i'm i'm still not entirely sure and nor is my lawyer because he in, in the end wrote a, a letter sort of in, con in, in concluding the whole matter um he wrote uh, quite a scathing letter to the um to the government there to the to the medical council and he was quite confused as to why it, I was in the, in the situation that I was, and they need to really rethink their uh, their process of, of um, screening candidates and, and potential doctors. And so, uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. I guess I think some universities uh, provide a lot more documentation. They will give you literally a curriculum of 300 pages. Mine didn't really have that, um, so I didn't present a curriculum of 300 pages. I had some some things, um, and in the end, last minute, I had to organise my university to send me a whole bunch of stuff about like the university curric like the the plan of lectures and what we did in every year so partly i would say my university doesn't really isn't really well set up for that kind of thing because maybe they just don't expect their graduates to go overseas it's it's probably a the fault of my university as well but um all in all it, it still doesn't it still doesn't make sense because the the government there then um organized the doctor another doctor to assess my application so they sent the documents off to a uh, to another an individual um and even she her assessment was that i had studied more hours in university than the standard degree here and that i should be given the uh the the uh, approbation the the medical license given also my experience and that i'm also a previous pharmacist and this and that and despite the government, the, the the council in in Bavaria engaging her and her assessment saying he should have the medical license. They still rejected her opinion as well, her assessment. So, yeah, it's it's all a bit bizarre. And in the end, the whole process uh, took a year, and I eventually decided against appealing and, and all that kind of stuff. And I just decided to sit the um uh, the Kenneth Prüfung. I think that me and you kind of uh, reached Germany right at the wrong time because. 
Mm. For, for example, I think I was the first session of people who, who did the Farschbach prüfung in Bayern. I was actually, my story is quite interesting. I don't know if I told you about this, but I tried submitting my documents by the end of March because mm. I knew that in the first of April, they're going to start introducing this new exam. And I submitted it, I think in the last day of March, and they still asked me to do the exam and, and you know how much time I had to waste because of that. And I think the same thing goes to you. I know of many people who came from different countries around the world who didn't have to do the kidneys proofing in the early 2010s, 2012, 2015. And I think they, they, they made a lot of changes exact during those two, three years, that time frame from 2016, 2018. I think many things changed here. I think we did uh, we did come at a time when, the, when they were sort of really rethinking their whole process of uh, of um, <clears throat> issuing medical licenses because there'd probably been a few cases of doctors here that had, had some had caused you know had some mistakes um, uh, in practice um, based on language barriers and this and that. And I do remember as once I'd finished this whole process, I remember reading in the in the local journals that they were really considering rethinking the whole system and just recommending all the medical councils in, in Germany just to do just um, across the board exams for every candidate and just to, to do away with this whole process of vetting their documents because it just gets too confusing with different languages and then lawyers getting involved right. and this and that. So we did come at very much a, um, at, a, at, a, at a time when, yeah, there's a lot of indecision um, in the country at the moment in, in that regard. And just shortly are... to the listen, sorry, Mila, just shortly to the listeners who don't know, EU graduates, it doesn't matter where they graduated in, they don't have to do the Kentness proofing or the, or the medical knowledge exam. That's if right. you graduated in a European Union accredited university, you're not going to have to do this exam, only the Fachspach proofing, which is the medical language exam. Okay. So this process is a process that people who graduated outside of the EU uh, need to go through. Yeah, I just wanted to add that in to yeah. avoid confusion. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Mina. I just wanted to, to ask you, all your documentation, you had to translate it into German? No. No. Some, some of it, some of it I had to, but um, by the second round when they requested more documentation and I ended up getting more stuff from my uni, um, because it was all in English, they accepted it. They, they didn't want it translated. They generally will accept, obviously, German and English. This is also important. It really depends on where you submit your documents. Because, for example, in my case, I had to translate everything into German. Mm. Not only uh, the, the Hebrew documents, because mm. I have graduated in Israel, but mm. also all the English documentation as well. So it really depends. Okay. This is okay. really important to know the requirements of this particular land or the part where you submit your documents. Yeah. Well, that's that's the issue here. It's, there's nothing uniform here with all yeah, the states exactly. doing their own thing. Some want translation, some don't. I initially, when I first applied, um, I actually applied in Saxon, in Saxony. And I found the whole process, just the initial process of making an appointment, organizing an appointment and going there was so much nicer, more relaxed compared to Bavaria. Whereas in Bavaria, it was very... It was cold. You couldn't you couldn't speak to anyone. It was literally everything was per post. And if something um, is missing, or if you don't have the the right documentation, you have to resend it. And then it takes another four, five, six weeks or whatever before they look at your documents again. Whereas in Saxony, you'd make an appointment, you'd sit in front of someone, some like like in the Ausländer Amt in the immigration office, you sit there with someone, and you know you present your documents, and then they'll go through it with you. They have a chat with you. I found the whole process in in Saxony a lot more pleasant um, compared to, to uh, Bavaria. So this is very important to all of our listeners who want to come to Germany. You want to live in Berlin, you want to live in Munich, you have the dream, don't just say, okay, so let's send the documents to the place where I want to live in. You have the option to choose where you're going to submit the documents. And even if you get approved in Hamburg, in Sachsen-Anhalt, in Berlin, wherever it is, you can still work the medical license that's going to be valid all over Germany. So do your research and find a place that is going to, you know, save you the headache. That's what I'd advise your listeners as well. When I was going through the process, when we were going through the process in 2017, I remember hearing that Nordrhein-Westfalen was an absolute catastrophe in terms of 
the waiting time and how difficult the um, the Kedness proofing was. Whereas other states like Brandenburg and Saxony were actually a little bit easier. You could get your documents vetted quicker. Um, and also this Kedness proofing is undertaken completely differently in every single state. Some states yeah. like in Nordrhein Westfalen, it's really, really hard. And in some states I've heard um, even based on experiences that, that are posted online, that they do away with the whole clinical examination part of the Kenneth's proofing. They'll literally just have a panel discussion and that's it. So it's it's even the exam itself is, is undertaken um, or, or done completely differently in depending on what state you're in. So I'd advise your listeners to maybe just access a forum, be it be at Facebook or whatever, and try to get some experiences from current uh, doctors or individuals that are, are going through the process to find out which state at the moment is 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 most ideal or most suited to them. Yeah, things uh, here tend to be uh, pretty dynamic and things change. Yeah, mm. the, the matter of fact that things uh, tended to be difficult two or three years ago, it doesn't mean that this is the same way right now. So you really must do your homework before you are applying uh, um, or submitting your documents. Yeah, yep, I agree. I think it's a, it's a big commitment to once you send all the documents off and you've paid all that money for the translation and then your documents sit there for months before they may get looked at. So really, um, like, you really have to vet almost all the states here and have a look at which state at the moment has a greater demand or is, is easier to, to, to apply for. And the only way you can find out is just by, um, by asking people. Mm -hmm. So you went through the process and then you reached the decision, okay, I'm just going to do the exam. How is the exam for you? Tell us a little bit about it. My, my exam was in, uh, Bamberg, I think. Um, and it was in a fairly large hospital there. I uh, arrived with a few other doctors and essentially we all got divided off um, and so they would send all six of us off to different patients on different wards and we were on our own. So they said, look, you've got 20 minutes to go through um, the patient's file and then, you know, do an examination and take a history and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we came back, we sort of regrouped and then we walked together as a group to each patient basically. And um, you basically got asked questions at the bedside. So um, I was there when uh, the others got um, asked questions uh, about a patient and uh, what you presented with. And they got asked sort of questions about pathophysiology and anatomy and that kind of stuff. And then they came to, to my patient with me at the bed and they asked me the same, you know, similar kinds of questions. That whole process probably took about two, three hours. Um, and then we headed up to a room in the hospital and then it turned into more of a panel discussion. So um, it was the three doctors there, three Oberärzte, and myself with the other four or five doctors um, on the other side of the table. And they just do like a round, sort of round table discussion, basically asking each doctor or each of us um, a whole bunch of questions. They'll show us images, radiological images, be it MR, um, uh, M, uh, MRIs, CTs, X-rays, whatever. Um, yeah. And how would you describe it? Like, have you had the feeling that they want you to pass or did they, did they do everything to fail you or? Um, I've heard of some bad experiences. I've read some, some, some bad experiences online. I, mine was pretty relaxed. I felt they were actually quite, uh, quite nice. What was sort of un, um, unexpected was, uh, that they asked us a lot of neurology because a neurologist was, uh, on the panel and it wasn't quite clear if we actually do have to study also neurological uh, sort of neurology um, in preparation for the exam. So that was a bit of a surprise, but otherwise they're actually quite, quite nice. They were quite forthcoming. And you know, if, if you weren't quite sure that sort of uh, ask sort of lead on questions and, and try to guide you in the right direction. So it was, it was certainly pleasant. I'm, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I can't really fault them on, on that. And how long did it take you to prepare for the exam? Uh, when I, I think when I decided to sit the exam, I had about six to seven months to prepare. Um, whether you need six or seven months is, is really up to you. Um, it can be done in three or four months. It depends. It depends on if you're working or not. I mean, I was working full time at the time in mm -hmm. anesthetics. Uh, so you're working with basically with a Berufsalabens. 
I was working with the Berufserlaubnis, which is valid for two years. Um, yeah. And so I try to do a bit about two to three hours every day after work. It depends on what you're doing. I mean, if you're working in internal medicine or in surgery, you often don't even have to, I mean, you have to study, but um, a lot of what you're exposed to is going to be enough also for, for the exam. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I did about five, six months because it, it can it can be relatively high stakes because you essentially only get one shot a year or two shots per year, I think. Um, in, at least in Bavaria, they did it in March and then in October. Okay. Right. This is an exam, by the way, that you can do three times, you know. Is it three uh, times? Okay. Yeah, three overall. times. Yeah. Overall. And if you fail ah, right, right, three right. times, again, that's yep. everybody who's listening, you have to do your due diligence and check this and research and, and this changes per state. But we check this for the applicants. For the la latest that we know is that you have three chances to do this exam. And if you fail all three times, you're out. I mean, you're not going to have another chance to do it. Yeah. We're talking about the Cantonese proofing. Yeah. 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 The Fachsprach proofing, you can apply, uh, yeah, many, as many times as, as, as many as you want. Yeah, right. exactly. So you so, were, uh, you were finished with your, uh, Cantonese proofing. What, what came next? Well, I'd already had the, my job in um, in Bavaria, and then we uh, then I moved to um, to Berlin. And oh, wait, I... so you got your your medical license, the Proportion, when? How how long after the exam? Um, the exam, I so you find out if you pass or not um, on the spot on the day. They tell oh, you okay. they, they they ask you to leave the room, and then uh, mm. they call in one, every can uh, each candidate one at a time. Um, they tell you if you pass or not, and then that was in September. And I got my approbation certificate Urkunde in November. So that was about two months it took. Okay. And then you um, received the medical license by, by mail or did you have no, to pick I, it up? I picked it up. <laughs> they can they can they can mail it to you, but <laughs> I uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't rely on uh, Wait, that's too long. <laughs> that's a long <laughs> I wouldn't rely on German snail mail. Uh, I, I wanted to just pick it up myself as soon as possible. Okay. okay. And the time you have worked uh, while you were preparing for this exam, um, did it count into your overall residency no. period? That I've that I've confirmed as well. Uh, the one year that I did under Berufserlaubnis uh, will not count. Uh, I had already cl um, clarified that with the uh, the Berliner Ärztekammer. Unfortunately, anything you do, any time you've spent working as a doctor during Berufserlaubnis will not count. Yeah. All right. So this is also something that changes per state, right? Yeah. We've heard about cases that have been mm. counting. So yeah. Yeah, at, at least in Berlin, matter. I can say that it's, yeah. it's not, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you, you were in... You were in uh, Bavaria, you were working as a anesthesiologist during the Berufserlaubnis, and then you got your medical license and you decided to stay there for a little bit longer or did you make your move immediately nah, afterwards? Nah, after that, I moved, uh, moved to Berlin and uh, got a job at uh, yeah, a larger, larger hospital in, in, in Berlin, yeah. And how's the experience like for moving from a smaller city to, you know, now you're in the capital city, Big hospital. How's the transition? It's a big culture difference, that's for sure. Um, in terms of uh, medicine and all that kind of stuff, obviously also a bit of a um, bit of a change because the, the patients are dealing with the, the sickest of the sick. Um, mm. So it's a lot more challenging in that regard. Um, it's obviously very. This is obviously very much dependent on where you work, but also in larger hospitals, I find you get a lot less supervision so you're very much left to your own devices which right. can be initially very very stressful um so it was still it was, it was quite a overall a culture shock and an, also a professional shock um starting in a, in a big a very big hospital but after a couple of months you, you adapt okay so why anesthesiology how did you decide um, on this residency for me it was always a choice between radiology or anesthesiology i think um I enjoy the uh, I enjoy the uh, the physiology, the pharmacology, especially with my pharmacy background. I, f I enjoy the fact that you can um, you can have you can make such quick changes to a patient's physiology in real time during an operation. And anesthesiology is a good mix of um, sort of 
hands-on medicine as well as um, more sort of theoretical kind of medicine. Um, obviously not to the to the degree of uh, our internal medicine colleagues, but um, it's a good mix. And then when you when you're finished, you've got a few opportunities um, with regards to subspecialty training, whether you want to do chronic pain, um, emergency ICU. So I feel like it's a nice nice mix of surgery and internal medicine with some hands-on skills. So that okay. appealed to me the most. Okay. So now you're in a, a big hospital in Berlin, right? You have, uh, you're working now in the capital. Would you, if going back, would you have made the same decision? Do you think it benefited you? Would, would you have done later, uh, beforehand? Tell us a little bit about your thoughts. Do you mean in terms of my application for medical licensing here? Uh, no, I mean, in terms of moving, making the move to, to, Germany. to Berlin, no, to Berlin, oh, to Berlin. Mm. Yeah. No, no, I think if anything, I would have changed was probably, I wouldn't have applied in Bavaria. I would have applied elsewhere for my medical licensing, um, or I probably would have even applied in Berlin, um, to begin with. So you feel if you would have applied in a different state, you, there's a big chance you could have avoided the Cantonese approval. Yeah. Yeah. And my lawyer said the same thing as well. It's, uh, was a very much a, a sort of yeah. game of luck. So, mm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now you're still in Berlin at the moment, right? I am. In the same hospital or did you move? No, I did two years in a, in a large hospital and then I moved to a sort of a mid-sized hospital. Okay. Um, and yeah, I'm very much happy there. So uh, many people, uh, when they are moving to Germany or when many uh, physicians, our colleagues want to move to Germany, they are talking or they have heard about the great life-work balance. Can you talk about it a little bit? Uh, Work-life balance in medicine is a... <laughs> I'm not sure if that truly, really exists. It depends what you do for a specialty. But um, in, uh, in relative terms compared to, say, Switzerland, we do, I think, less hours. I mean, the basic contract is either for 40 or 42 hours, but it's, mm -hmm. really, it's highly dependent on what specialty you do. If you're going to do something like surgery... A forty-hour contract means nothing. You, you're going to be you're going to end up doing seventy, eighty hours a week. Um, mm. If you want to do something a bit more, a uh, bit more sort of relaxed or laid back, then you'd go do something like um, betrieb's medicine, medicine, whatever it's called in in, mm -hmm. in English, um, or maybe GP training Occupa or health training, medicine, yeah. okay. occupational yeah. occupational medicine. Yeah. Um, it, it's all it's very relative. It's, it just depends on what you do for a specialty. Um, it also depends on what hospital you work in. There are much, much smaller hospitals where you could actually do surgical training and it's a lot more um, relaxed in terms of hours and workload compared to working in a, a university hospital. So it's, it's highly variable. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, in regard uh, to your own residency, um, do you have any balance or do you think it's... Uh... I think one important thing to add here is okay first of all do you how's your work-life balance now yeah. as an anesthesiologist and how was it different in a smaller hospital in a in a smaller city so that would be interesting to hear my work-life balance in in when i was in nuremberg in that smaller hospital was was very cruisy it was okay. always went home on time the night shifts were very very um very cruisy very relaxed um not not many emergencies um, and then the university hospital I was working at in Berlin. Um, yeah, I mean, we worked through the night. So the Bereitschaft into the 24 hour shifts, we were literally just working 24 hours. So it never stops. Um, and now in the hospital, I'm in mean, now mid size, it's also quite busy. Depends what kind of, what, what kind of shift you're doing, uh, whether you're, you're looking after the, um, the birthing suites, you're, you're often, you won't get much sleep. Um, or if you're in the, uh, if you're covering the theaters, then you generally, um, we'll be able to take, get some sleep, uh, at night. I'm currently on ICU, so it's a completely different system. They don't do Bereitschaft in, so they do more just a typical traditional, um, shift system where you have two, three shifts. So you work a night shift, but you actually have to work. So, um, that's, a li I find ICU is probably one of the harder rotations, uh, here in Germany. That's the one that the most, uh, everyone says is the most challenging in terms of workload, stress, hours. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. And how are your relationship? How is your relationship with your colleagues, um, with your, with the other assistants at the, with the, your superiors? Do you feel like there's a team feeling in the hospital or is it like military hierarchy? Tell us a little bit about that. No, I mean, in my current hospital, it's fantastic. It's like a big family. It's, uh, even the, uh, the relationship between the different departments, um, it's it's very relaxed. Um, everyone's very approachable. The orbits are very approachable. It's uh, it's actually the reason why I, I want to stay in Berlin only because of this hospital. It's it's a very very uh, fun environment to work in. Very right. flat, very flat hierarchy, which is very much different to what I experienced in Australia. So I, yeah, I do enjoy it quite a lot. And how much? T- sorry, okay. for interrupting. How much time do you have? Uh in the residency to complete it about a year and a half left okay yeah. and afterwards would you stay there because you have uh, mentioned as a ober uh, not ober arts but fach arts first of all which is a senior physician yeah i would uh, i'd consider staying there um yeah, it's hard to know where i'm going to be in, in a couple of years time but uh I'm very happy to stay there. I think it's in terms of the clinical exposure. It's a great hospital because you get a very broad clinical exposure in my hospital with pediatrics, um, OBGYN, and obviously everything to do with adults. Um, no idea. I mean, there's just so many, so many potential options and doors. Once you're a facharts, you can do, depending on what kind of specialty, you can do private practice. You can do locum work or, or lay arts uh, work, as they call it here. Um, you can do, um, Nordfall medicine. There's, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, I'm not entirely sure yet what I want to do. Mm, most likely reduce my hours a little bit. Um, but yeah, the, the plenty of doors are open. Okay. And you have this, uh, do you have this opportunity to reduce, uh, the number of hours? Absolutely. My okay. hospital, I think the vast majority of the consultants, the Fachärzte are all on part-time contracts, be it 60%, 80%, the vast majority of them are doing part-time. Okay. That's, that's amazing. Actually, you don't yeah. see that in every country, no. right? No, you don't, <laughs> you don't. It, where I come from, you have senior doctors working from eight till four in the hospital and then at five o'clock working in the practice until 9 PM or yeah. 10 PM. No. So that's, that's a huge benefit you have here in Germany. Now, one thing I wanted to ask, um, that's not particular to medicine. Many people want to move to Germany, not necessarily because of the medicine, but they also want the lifestyle. So tell us a little bit about what you do outside of medicine. What do you like to do as a hobby, your hobbies, how much time you have for them? And, you know, just tell people about the life in Germany. Life in Germany is good. Um, I think being in the center of Europe has its advantages. It's, I guess it's one of the reasons why a lot of people want to move to Europe. And that was certainly a, um, a draw card for me the ability to to sort of plan into your roster to get a Friday off, Saturday off and Sunday off and just fly out on a Thursday night to Milan or whatever and then come back on a Sunday night. You can do that quite often here, which is which is fantastic. Um, obviously it does get cold, but you have four proper seasons and, and with that comes, you know, the opportunity to experience different things. Um, outside of work, I, you know, I like doing a lot of exercise. I like reading, I like, um, sort of engaging with the share market and that kind of stuff, catching up with friends. I find living in a city like Berlin or in any kind of European city, cause they're very dense or condensed. Um, it's quite easy to get around. You don't need a car. Um, public transport is fantastic. It's, it's a very good work life balance, a very good, um, yeah, it's a good work-life balance once you once you at least when I'm back or when I'll be back in anesthetics. But it's a, um, I think the Europeans do appreciate quality of life. It's very important for them. Uh, I don't think there's that sense in in maybe some Western countries like America or Australia, where there's probably a bit more priority on on work. sort of work, work and find them um, and sort of financial motives and that kind of stuff. The Europeans are very much about that kind of work-life balance and. Um, and yeah, um, it just, you can just see in a country like this, when, when on a Sunday, everything closes, everything's closed because Sunday is family day. I, I think it does, uh, speak, uh, speak to the culture of the country. Yeah, so, uh, besides that, uh, you were telling us, um, 
previously before we started the recording that you are about to fly out for uh, for your vacation. Tell us a, a little bit about that. Uh, as a treat to myself for uh, surviving ICU after one year, I'm flying to Thailand in mid-May nice. for two weeks. Get some sun, relax. Yeah. yeah. That is something you can also do when you work in Germany. You can fly right. to Thailand. You have enough time for that. 100%. Especially if you uh, if you can live in a city in, uh, or if you can live in Frankfurt or nearby, uh, access to Frankfurt Airport is very, very handy. Yeah. Right. I mean, you also have Berlin is also very beneficial, right? You have many the international many flights. Airport. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, don't get me wrong. The new airport is good. Um, it just doesn't have the same connections as uh, Frankfurt. Frankfurt, Frankfurt right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Okay. So I uh, think uh, another question I have. Um, so uh, what are you? What are your plans for the future? Like, uh, would you like to go? Because many of our colleagues, when they are uh, done with the residency, they are thinking many of them are going to th uh, want to go private, or they would like to stay in the hospital. What are your thoughts about it? Um, ideally, if I can have a mix, I, I would. I'm going to try to aim to to have a mix in. Uh, in my career, I wouldn't mind going private. There's obviously financial benefits to that, but um, I think the clinical exposure is always better in, in, in the public healthcare system. Um, so I try to maintain, if I can, maybe one or two shifts a week in, in a hospital and then one or two on the side, whether it be lay arts work or in a private clinic. Um, I have intentions of potentially doing an MBA and sort of more experiencing more the business side of things and learning a bit more about management, seeing where that takes me, um, because there's also a, a multitude of options uh, in that regard here. Um, yeah, I think it's it, the fact that I've, there's, there's so many options and there's so many doors that are open is, is, is quite nice. That's, uh, I can't complain. So. Oh, just, I just wanted to add to the listeners, once you are um, a specialized doctor in Germany. You don't have to stay in the hospital. You have so many options. You can go work in the pharma. You can go work private. You can go work as a medical examiner or a good doctor, like they call it. You can go to a different country in Europe. You know, you have so many options. And one thing that you have to remember is there are countries that once you're a, you're a, a specialized doctor, you have to work even harder. You have to even put more hours than before. Here, you, most people, many people, they, they go to tired site or half a position and work only 20 or 30 hours. So that's, that's, that's one of the benefits you get in working in a country like Germany. How do you see the medical system here going forward? What do you think um, some problems that you, we can face as doctors in Germany? What do you think um, can be change just tell us a little bit about your perspective as somebody who has seen different medical systems around the world and has seen um trends what do you think is a problem here at the moment or do you think it's going to appear and how can it be changed just for example the lack of doctors as a, a big one well, one thing <clears throat> with regards to lack of doctors that is a big issue in australia when you're a consultant you generally don't go part-time because once you become a consultant or a fuck arts in Australia, you have to keep working to, to build up a reputation, to maintain a job, to build up your, um, your sort of your private, your, your reputation to be able to do private work. You mm. very, very rarely see doctors there go part-time unless they're a little bit older. Whereas here, I find just because everyone's so exhausted from their, from their training, the moment they become fuck arts, it's literally the first, even, even, even as an assistant arts, so many doctors will just go 80% or 70% because they're so um, just overwhelmed and, 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 and exhausted um, from the whole process. And I think that's very much the detriment of the healthcare system here, because then you have a whole bunch of doctors, but not all of them are working to 100% capacity. A lot of them are working to 80%, 70%, which is good for us. So by all means, mm -hmm. you can, even as, a, even as a doctor in training, you can do 50%. I mean, I know some doctors that have been assistant outs for 10 years 11 years so it's very flexible in that regard uh but it's also to the detriment of the system here where you have it's uh, the system is especially in germany is very overburdened um they do provide a lot of beds but the only way they can provide those beds 
given how how how, how, how many um, nurses and doctors you have in hospital, the staffing ratio is not maybe up to the standards of other countries. So uh, as an example, in ICU in Australia, day shift is one to one, nurse to patient. In Germany here, it's one to three, and that's during the day shift. So that's the only that, and because of that, that means more workload. Um, I sometimes just feel like the the demand for medical services, obviously worldwide, is growing. Um, at some point, if they don't replenish uh, the staff, if they don't bring in new fresh blood uh, in terms of nursing and, and doctors, at some point something something has to give, um, and that's obviously a challenge faced by many health systems around the world. Um, in the case of America, it's probably the uh, the cost uh, uh, of, med of, of medical um, health care. But here in Germany, I think they do a good job in, in providing uh, a good health care, but they are very much overstretched in terms of resources. And at some point, something's going to give, I think. So that's great news for you listeners. If you're, if you're a hard worker, you're going to have a lot of success here in Germany. Wow. So Dan, so much information, so much to, to learn from you. Let's, let's give him some, <laughs> some claps. Make it extra long, extra long. Oh, it'll extra long. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is going to help so many people out. You know, yeah. we, di I didn't, when I came here and I'm sure that's, that's, you would say the same, we didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, sources to learn from. We didn't have that, you know, that knowledge base where you can just learn from others. And even if it did, it was, you know, like something very close and something very in, in the German language. So you're going to help a lot of people who are just starting their path uh, to moving to Germany as a doctor. So thank you very much for thank joining us. Thank you very us. much for your time. Thank you, guys. I think uh, what oh. you're doing is great. It's uh, something that we didn't have when we were coming here in 2017. And that was in 2017. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite, you're doing a good thing. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dan. So we're gonna we're gonna see you soon. And uh, for all the listeners, thank you for joining. Thank you. We're gonna have we're gonna have more guests in the future. We're gonna talk about similar things. Everybody's gonna put in his or her different perspective, and we're gonna learn from everyone. That's the goal. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Bye.